Hi, this is Jeff Gross from Mickey Fine Pharmacy. We are honored to support Sheba Medical Center, who is on the front lines fighting the COVID virus and serves as a leader of medical care in Israel and across the globe. Mickey Fine has serviced the community since 1962. We have been on the front lines servicing the community during this pandemic across our three pharmacy locations. We have added extra delivery drivers, widened curbside pickup. We carry a full selection of PPE products. Our pharmacy provides pill packaging, medication synchronization, and we do deliver and are open seven days a week. If you have not joined our family, it's time to socially distance from the chain stores and experience Mickey Fine's concierge service. Hello, my name is Molly Soberoff and I am the executive director of Friends of Sheba Medical Center. For 50 years, the Friends of Sheba in Los Angeles have been supporting Sheba Medical Center in Israel, now recognized for the second year in a row as one of the top 10 hospitals in the world. On behalf of the board of directors and our professional staff, welcome to today's webinar. While it has a formal title, to me, its real title is No Luncheon, No Problem. Since 1989, Friends of Sheba in Los Angeles has held a beautiful women's luncheon every single year to celebrate the many achievements and the latest advancements of our beloved Sheba. But this year was different, and our thoughts and our prayers go out to those who have been affected by this awful virus. I am here to tell you, though, that with dedication, strong leadership, and a supportive community like all of you. Together, we can achieve, even without a luncheon. Supporting the luncheon took on a whole new meaning this year, and one that has never been more critical, to help Sheba save precious lives and support the researchers who are working around the clock to find a vaccine for COVID. Thank you all for your support of Sheba's COVID-19 emergency fund. Sheba shines brighter because of your interest, your friendship, and your passion. When you have your lunch today, wherever it is, whenever it is, we want you to know how much we appreciate you. Before introducing today's keynote speaker, Dr. Eyal Zimlichman from Sheba Medical Center, we have a few quick housekeeping notes to cover. Everyone will stay on mute for the duration of today's session. Dr. Zimlichman will do his best to address all of the questions you have submitted upon registering, and thank you for doing so. And last, if you have any questions that come up during today's session, we encourage you to submit those in the chat box, and we'll try to have them addressed. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Ina Tuller and Vicki Unger, the Dynamo Chairs of this year's Women of Achievement Luncheon. Good morning. My name is Vicki Unger, and I'm proud to serve on the board of Friends of Sheba Medical Center in Los Angeles. It's hard to believe that this year marks my 14th year of involvement with Sheba. It is an honor for me and Ina Tuller, my luncheon co-chair and fellow board member, to welcome you to today's Women of Achievement webinar. Thank you for taking time to be with us today. Due to the pandemic, Friends of Sheba was unable to host our April 2nd Women of Achievement luncheon in Beverly Hills. We had great plans in store. Moving to a larger venue, given our record-breaking attendance in 2018 and 2019, honoring the amazing Beverly Cohen and Ifat Oren, and raising funds to support inpatient pediatric mental health services at Sheba Medical Center. Our dedicated luncheon committee here in Los Angeles 
rechanneled our efforts from planning a luncheon to raising over $230,000 for the COVID-19 emergency fund at Sheba Medical Center. Together, we have saved lives and funded critical COVID research. Since the outbreak in February, the doctors, researchers, and nurses at Sheba continue to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to find treatment solutions for COVID and provide the best possible care for all of the men, women, and children suffering from this deadly disease. I'm Ina Tuller, co-chair with Vicky of this year luncheon. We are so excited to be innovating alongside of Shiba Medical Center. This is our very first webinar in lieu of a luncheon. We are thrilled with the amount of money we have raised and thank you all so much for your support. We would also like to thank today's presenting sponsor, Mickey Fine Pharmacy and the owners, Gina and Jeff, for believing in Sheba's mission and caring for our local community. It is my honor now to introduce Dr. Eyal Zimlichman, the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Innovating Officer at Sheba Medical Center. Hi, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning with you. Um, hopefully we would have uh, preferred to do it uh, in person um, as uh, as we've done in last uh, few years, uh, but with the uh, situation, of course, uh, we're trying to do the best. And the idea here is to tell you the story of what is going on uh, at Chiba Medical Center in the past few months, specifically in regards to uh, innovation. Uh, in my role, I am uh, the chief medical officer and the chief innovation officer uh, at Chiba, um, and an internal medicine physician in my training. Um, and um, also the founder of ARC, our innovation program at Chiba. You might have heard about ARC before. Uh, we started ARC officially less than a year ago after working on building ARC for a few years uh, with the idea that uh, we want to play a major role in changing healthcare and how healthcare will need to look like by the year 2030. Um, it's a small uh, mission that we've set for us. And that is why we've been built a community, an international community or an ecosystem that together we're working on changing medicine and coming up with solutions to the most challenging problems that we have. Um, ARC, um, which is another story, of course, uh, to tell you the whole idea behind the ARC and the accomplishments that were made pre-COVID. But uh, about uh, four months ago, ARC was faced with another problem and that is COVID-19. Uh, this was around uh, the last week of February, beginning of March, when the first patients uh, came into Israel from the Diamond Princess uh, cruise ship in Japan. And Chiba was uh, uh, chosen as the hospital to house those first patients coming in. Um, we needed to make a decision at that point. How much is ARC and our innovation program at Chiba is going to play a major role um, in this new crisis? Uh, is innovation an uh, essential uh, force that uh, we have to bring um, uh, to work during this pandemic? Um, is it uh, just as important as nurses and physicians on the front lines? And it took us um, a very short while to understand that if we're going to uh, beat this virus, which at the time we knew very little about, and we still uh, are much in a mystery about a lot of the things around this virus uh, even today, innovation will have to play a critical role. Uh, and Shiba's ARC program will need to be completely um, um, brought to its full force to really make uh, an, an important con contribution in uh, fighting this virus. And so that's what happened. We actually declared what we called the battle mode, the ARC battle mode for COVID-19, with the idea that right now ARC is completely focusing on uh, battling COVID-19 on finding solutions to better understand the virus. And to do that, we've pretty much halted all of our activities that were not COVID related um, at the beginning of March to fully focus on, on that. Um, as we took our first steps into uh, trying to come up with solutions, we knew our major problems were numerous from trying to find a vaccine to trying to find a new medication 
to uh, coming up with uh, diagnostic solutions to allow us to more quickly identify the virus and people that contracted the virus, to coming up with solutions for ventilation. As you know, that was a major issue uh, that we were facing, faced with, especially in the first days of COVID. We've seen examples from uh, China, from north of uh, Italy, and even from New York about uh, hospitals that ran out of ventilators and uh, had to have new ventilation solutions if we were to be able to uh, provide treatment for every patient who uh, contracted the virus and became uh, mortally ill. We needed to come up with solutions for monitoring, come up with mobile solutions, come up with solutions around big data and artificial intelligence. And this was the full focus of what ARC has set out to do, coming up with solutions around all of these areas, which were our new focus starting the very initial days uh, in March uh, of this year. Uh, a lot of happened since then. Um, as you, you know, probably in Israel, we went through a first wave. We had a, um, a quiet period for about a month and a half. We're into a second wave right now. You know, I might be able to tell you more about that in, if you have questions later on. Uh, but what we've done later, and this happened uh, late in May, is decided to capture it all in what we call the Health Space 2030. What is Health Space 2030? You've seen the name on the invitation to this webinar. Health Space 2030 was the name we gave to a virtual environment, a simulated space in Sheba that allows us to test the technologies of the future in one location for multiple purposes, whether it's to demonstrate, whether it's to train our staff to work with new technology and new solutions. Uh, this was planned towards the end of this year when we sat down to, to plan for 2020. We didn't know, of course, we were expecting this pandemic uh, to come, al come along. Uh, and what happened during the months of, uh, of April was a decision we've made, which you have to agree was a fairly bold decision, not to wait with Health Space 2030 uh, to post-COVID, like many of our plans were put on hold, but to push forward and to implement this uh, smart room, smart patient room mm -hmm. here at Chiba, mm -hmm specifically directed towards COVID-19 to show our achievements and the amount of innovation that happened at Chiba during these months. And the innovation was really incredible. Uh, just to give you some numbers, we came up with more than 45 different um, um, invention declarations of different inventions. We filed for 17 patents during a span of about two and a half months, 17 patents. And about half of these patents we took to commercialization. Either a company spun out or we provided the license to the patent to another company to actually market and sell the product for about eight of our different inventions. This is incredible in a span of two and a half months. These are numbers that we typically see in a year or even more than a year. But in two and a half months, because of the amount of innovation we were pushing for, uh, during times of crisis and utilizing what ARC stands for, the acceleration to redesign healthcare by collaborating with partners and partnering up with all the different partners we had here in Israel and abroad. And I'll be happy to, to talk more about that if there'll be any questions later on. We were able to achieve uh, much of these achievements you're going to see in a few seconds. So we've put it all together in this virtual space and then to demonstrate it, we came up with this video that you're going to see now. And what we're going to do now is run through the video, which is a simulation of a patient uh, contracting the disease and then going through the different stages of the disease as we follow the patient and understand what kind of technology uh, is at hand uh, that came out of Sheba. I'll stop here and there a few times to share that with you and show you the, uh, uh, some, to pause on some of the technologies uh, and provide some more information. So this is our patient, uh, Mr. Joel Cohen, 40 years old, tested positive. And you see him here in a hospital room at Chiba. This is, of course, a simulated room. But what we see in the simulated room mm -hmm. is also a control room where the staff is behind the glass Everything will be okay. looking inside into um, what's going on with the patient. I'll talk to you in a minute. Let's see what's going okay, on. Okay, bye. Hello, Mr. Cohen. My name is Dr. Goodman, and I'm about to ask you a few questions regarding your medical condition. 
We will use some new technologies that can assist us to evaluate your uh, condition. So, how do you feel today? I feel okay. Are you sure? You know, the Vocalis app installed on your cell phone detects changes in your voice and breathing. It might indicate a deterioration in your condition. Have you noticed any changes during the night? Nothing out of the ordinary. Do you have a cough? No. Do you still feel any shortness of breath? Now that you mention it, it might be, um, it might be a bit worse than yesterday. Can you describe what has changed? I don't know. I, have, I feel like I can't get enough air. I'm sorry to hear that. So in order to help you, I will need to examine you. And as you know, we will be using the checks remotely and I will need your help. If something is... So just a couple of pointers before we continue. First of all, this is an actor, so not to worry. It's not a real patient and uh, everything is, is just played along. Uh, what we've heard already is we've seen the use of two technologies. One is this robot you see. This is an Israeli uh, robot developed with uh, Sheba Medical Center um, called Meditemi. And the robot allows the staff to come and approach the, the patient and talk with the patient. And the idea was we are trying to minimize the, uh, uh, the uh, contact between our staff and the patients so that we prevent staff from contracting the virus. As you know, this was an issue uh, in China, in Italy, in some other locations where many of the staff members became sick. Some of the staff member even died because of this disease. And that is a major problem. And of course, we wanted to try and avoid it as much as possible. So when possible, we use this robot Meditemi that you're seeing here. The other technology we've heard about is the Vocalis app. Now, the Vocalis app is an app on your phone that is being developed now at Chiba that allows uh, the uh, patient to talk into the app on his phone and through the app we're able to diagnose the severity of the symptoms and also whether there is a virus or not. This is now going through tests and studies. We're getting great results on diagnosing the severity of symptoms and we're working on diagnosing the virus. We're still uh, quite away from that point, but even just being able to diagnose the symptoms is of course of great help. So let's continue to see what's going on. If you have any on. questions, please let me know. And please now open the tie to care kit next to you. And we will start with you holding the main device. So what we see here is another technology, an Israel technology working with Sheba called Taito Care. Great, exactly that one. We're yes. using this technology to allow to the doctor, so hold the who's in another room, I remind you, you in this case in the control room, to examine the patient Great. without so being in the same room with him. And you'll see in a second, apart from measuring temperature as we're seeing right now, this technology is also able to listen to the heart of the patient, listen to the lung sounds of the patient, look into the throat and look into the ear of the patient. And so the doctor, again, in another room, is able to do almost a complete physical examination on our patient without being in the same room with him and in danger of contracting the virus. Let's see how that's being done. This? Yes, exactly. You, can, you will be seeing it on the screen as well in a second. Mm -hmm. Connect it. Great. Okay. So now you can see your chest and we will be checking for lung sounds remotely. So please place the stethoscope on your chest as shown. Good, great. You can now move it to the next spot, as shown. Okay, now move it to the next spot. And to the next spot. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cohen, for helping me. All of the information from your exams will be recorded directly to your medical file. And for the meantime, please try to rest as much as possible. And if you need anything, please let us know. A couple of days later, as you see, same department, we're looking at the technology called EarlySense. This is the monitor. EarlySense is an Israeli technology that allows us to monitor the patients continuously. The sensor is under the mattress, not touching the patient at all, but allowing us to measure continuously very important vital signs like heart rate and respiration rate. And through an artificial intelligence solution, the device is able to warn us 
when the patient is about to deteriorate. What you can see here on the screen is heart rate and ventilation rate across time going up and the artificial intelligence alerting us that something is wrong with the patient. Now okay. the, the doctor is coming into the room because we so need hello, Mr. Cohen. the it's physical me, contact. Dr. Goodman, we spoke before through the screen. I've come in to speak to you. So I would like to tell you that through the early sense system that is connected to you, we can see that you are having more difficulties in breathing. Yes. And uh, we really would like to see if we can go on treating you here, but we would like to consider the ability to transfer you to the intensive care unit if needed. So first of all, what I want to give you is a little bit more oxygen than you're receiving now through the mask. It's a mask with a bag, do you see, like this. Just breathe normally through it. Okay? Great. Now, I know you might have concerns and questions, and please ask anything that you have to ask. But first of all, I would like to ask you, would you like to speak to your family? Uh, yeah, I understand. Can I, can I uh, speak to my wife? Certainly, and we'll do our best to organize it through our screen so that you have better visual and that you can speak to her. As, okay? as you might know, uh, one of the problems that we have with COVID patients is um, contact with their family members. So we try to avoid contact between, of course, healthy family members and the patient, again, with the uh, danger of them contracting the virus. And again, we can use technology to allow the family members to speak with their loved ones. This is critical because in many ways or many places around the world where the technology does not exist, believe it or not, there is very, very little communication between patient and family up to the last minutes of the life in some of the uh, patients that even died in the hospital. We've heard a lot about these instances and technology can come and help us to uh, increase and allow communication. Hey, Joe. Hey, how are you? You don't look good. I'm okay. Um, my situation's getting um, a little bit uh, worse. So uh, they're transferring. They're transferring me to intensive Where? intensive care unit. You have trouble breathing. Yes. Yeah, so I'll talk to you. As soon as I can. You can talk to me in the ICU like we're talking now? I don't know. But I'll let you know. As soon as I can. As soon as I can. I love you. We've had a lot of responses from family members that said that this type of technology really helped them in keeping communication with their loved ones inside the hospital. So this was uh, very critical uh, on day to day for uh, Mr. Cohen in bed number one to the intensive care unit. Can you help me find uh, an available bed for him? Okay, let me see in the clue system if there is an available bed over there. Okay, I can see that bed number four is available and okay. uh, I'm, I'm going to coordinate the transfer. Okay, great, thank you so much. The, uh, what we've seen was the uh, clue medical system, which is an artificial intelligence system again that allows us to manage all of our intensive care unit patients. In one system, we get all the uh, data and all the insights and the uh, alerts about patients in the ICU so we can know which patient is ready to be discharged and which patient is in danger of continuously uh, deteriorating and so on. What you're seeing now is another technology that was developed here at Chiba together with a company called AnyVision. It allows us to perform investigations into contacts that happen in the hospital if we want to identify contacts for isolation. So for example, if we have a staff member who was found positive for the virus, we need to trace back and see who are the other staff members that were in contact with this person so that they need to go into isolation as well and we're using an artificial intelligence again to uh, diagnose contacts between people. You can see here in this demonstration, um, we know that uh, this doctor specifically was found positive 
and we can see who was in contact with the computer would actually tell us uh, who needs to go into isolation. This is of course something that we're now putting available to all hospitals in the world and it's a technology that can really help in diagnosing uh, the, uh, uh, the contacts and probable um, people that contract the virus. So now we're moving into the uh, intensive care unit. Our patient yeah, has the Can you tell the urine output in the last hour? Mm -hmm. Yeah, according to the Sereno system, it's 105 milliliters. It's been like that for the past eight hours. Dr. Ellen, yeah. we just got a notification by the clue system that Mr. Cohen in bed number three is expected to be in a severe respiratory deterioration in the next eight hours. Oh, let me see his vital signs. Mm -hmm. Again, this is the clue, uh -huh. uh, I understand clue that. system okay. I think that we, I've mentioned before. It allows us to see which patients are about to deteriorate. Uh, eight hours upfront uh, alert. Mr. Cohen, how are you feeling? Not that good. We can see that you're having respiratory problems. What we would like to do now is sedate you and ventilate you. I think it's going to help you much more. Now, when we sedate you, you're going to be asleep. So would you like me to call your wife before, so you can speak to her a little bit before? Yes, please call. My wife is... No problem. As soon as possible. No problem, we will do that. Hello, honey, can you hear me? Yes. How are you doing? We're fine, but what about you? What's going on? Tell me everything. Uh, I don't want to get you worried, but... Uh, this is another well, communication not, uh, system called a company called Uniper yeah, that was actually built to be used at home, mostly for elderly people at home who need uh, to be able to communicate with family members, with friends, with communities. It can be attached to any television and turns, turning the television into a communication station that allows um, uh, people, uh, elderly people at home who are many times alone to have a full community through the TV. Send my regards to your mom, your dad. And we're going to meet very soon, I promise. I love you so much. Love you. Take care. I'll pray for you. Yeah, you pray for me. Bye, honey. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Anesthesiologist to bed four, please. So what do you say about that? What does it mean? It means that uh, his status, his conditions deteriorate during that Patient time. in bed four is a respiratory distress. Wait a second. <coughs> Nurse Naomi, please get to bed number four. Now what we're seeing is uh, the nurse in the uh, ICU, she has a problem with the ventilator. Instead of calling a technician Hi, Dr. Miller, this is Naomi, to come the in, in the COVID she puts ICU. on augmented reality glasses. Uh, this is the Microsoft HoloLens 2, one of the most advanced augmented reality glasses in the world. And the technician actually helps her through the augmented reality to solve the problem. Let's see how it works. Okay, the patient circuit looks fine. Show me, please, the ventilator screen. Okay, let, let me show you which button you should press. Okay. It's this one. Can you see? No. Okay. You should press this button. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lower the feet from 10 to 3. This is, this is called uh, uh, teleguidance. Thank you. The alarm is resolved. You're welcome. So this was our patient as he went through the uh, intensive care unit and, um, and then we'll see what happens later. Of course, I'll let you know it has a good ending, so not to worry. Yeah. 
This is one of our staff members. Um, she is after a long uh, shift. She has some free time. One of the things we uh, are also trying to do is to provide some relaxation to the staff members because we know with the COVID-19, we're seeing uh, um, a lot of strain on our um, clinical teams and burnout. And one of the things that was shown uh, to help is this type of relaxation as using, uh, again, augmented and virtual reality. So our patient actually, his condition has improved and okay. is now in the rehabilitation, well, respiratory rehabilitation department. Now he does not have the virus and so his wife is uh, next to him holding his hand. And of course, this is a much more, uh, a better way to communicate than through screens. I love you and I'll be here. I'll be here forever, I promise. So, uh, so this was uh, the um, journey we've taken together. I now hear there's, uh, there might be a Netflix series uh, that starts uh, about uh, the COVID-19 patients at Shiba. And of course, that's just uh, humor. But uh, uh, from our perspective, this was one uh, way in about 15 to 20 minutes to show, uh, showcase much of the innovation that just came out from Shiba in a matter of about two and a half months. This was really unparalleled. Um, and we've shared some of this uh, with many of our friends and collaborators around the world. We've had a webinar uh, at the end of May with more than a thousand people from around the world that joined and have seen this, uh, uh, this use, of, of use of this technology. And we're helping many hospitals around the world to, uh, to use this technology and better treat their patients. Uh, it's part of the uh, ARC mission and SHIBA's mission to be a guiding light and show uh, uh, the path forward for many uh, of the other hospitals around the world, and we're putting a big uh, effort on that. Um, so I think I'll stop here, and of course, uh, we'll uh, leave time for, uh, for questions. I'll be happy to take those. Thank you, uh, Ayal. Uh, people should understand in LA that... Uh, Ayal has been averaging at least one to two webinars a day. Uh, I don't know how much uh, rest he's actually gotten during these last few months. Usually he spends his time on, on planes when he's been grounded. So since he's been grounded, he's been able to do webinars and devote a tremendous amount of time to helping to develop these revolutionary technologies. And so uh, because he's been literally on the front lines, uh, we're gonna go and uh, ask him the, some of the questions that have been submitted uh, for today. So first of all, I, I think it's important that everybody wants to know, we know what the situation is in California, we know what the situation is across America, and unfortunately now we have been dragged into uh, what we call a second wave. I don't know if it's a second wave or a continuation of the first wave. Can you explain to our, our guests uh, today uh, where Israel is going? and what it's doing in order to deal with this second wave going forward. Sure, so for those of you, uh, I'm sure many of you are following the news coming out of Israel, but uh, just to sort of recap, we had our first wave. Uh, we've seen maybe uh, a total of about uh, 18,000 patients uh, in the span of uh, two and a half to three months um, with about 300 people dead. Of course, every person dead is a tragedy, but the overall numbers looked very, very, uh, small uh, and low compared to the entire world. Um, we were very much uh, uh, talked about as an example of how this uh, uh, type of pandemic needs to be handled. Uh, we, after a long lockdown, we started reopening and apparently we know this now, the reopening was too fast and, um, and people thought that this was behind us. We were too optimistic and uh, sure enough, the virus is still around and uh, uh, has brought up his, its head again. And we're in this, what we call now the second wave with uh, more than now 30,000 people in Israel that uh, were tested positive. Uh, so, uh, so numbers are continuing to grow. However, this is critical to uh, mention and I will say why I think this is so. We're still seeing a very low rate of mortality, a very low rate of uh, patients on a ventilator. Um, right now in the entire country of Israel, we have about um, less than 50 people on a ventilator in the entire country. Here at Chiba, we have uh, five. 
So uh, really low numbers, um, obviously, as you compare them to uh, um, the U.S. or any other country, although the uh, prevalence, the number of people on the, uh, in the community now that have the virus is always on the rise. And whether we're going to need to go through a second lockdown is still an open question. The reason I think we're seeing a low uh, mortality rate, which is really one of the lowest in the world, is I think two reasons. One, we've done a pretty good job in protecting the elderly population. Uh, we're seeing that the average age of people that have contracted the virus is very low compared to other countries. And as long as it remains low, we're going to see low uh, numbers of people hospitalized and of course serious cases and of course uh, mortality. And this has been one success here in Israel that uh, without it we would have been in a very different situation. The second is what we're seeing in the second time around as we're encountering this virus now for the second time around, we're seeing that we're much better able to treat patients. We have a better sense of what works and what doesn't we know what kind of drugs to provide to patients. We know that we're trying to delay ventilation um, as much as possible rather than uh, go to ventilation very early on as we've done in the first wave. Much of that are the things we've learned here at Chiba and globally. And of course, we're working with the international community to gather every insight possible. We've also done a lot of work around big data and using uh, uh, applications such as artificial intelligence to alert us to what kind of therapy each patient needs. All of these solutions, I think, helps us get better results for our patients, and that is why we're seeing a high number of patients that are um, very mild or even, um, or even intermediate, but very low number of severe patients and, of course, ventilated patients. So from that pers perspective, although numbers are rising every day, and although we might go into another lockdown, I think we are doing a good job in controlling the severe cases and, of course, having a very low mortality rate. Hopefully, that doesn't change. Ayal, uh, there's always been speculation uh, about uh, the people who have contracted the virus. Uh, according to our statistics today at Sheba, 60% of those who have corona are men, 40% are women. Has that been the, the standard from the first wave or has it changed and is there a reason for that? We have seen this in the first wave as well. I think uh, we've seen this type of uh, statistics in other places in the world. Um, we know that uh, men uh, very slightly um, contract the virus more than women, maybe two or 3% uh, difference. But um, the severe cases, if you are a man, it's a type of risk factor for this virus. So uh, if you contr contract the virus, men are probably a bit more likely to develop a, uh, a uh, severe disease than women are. And so when we look at only patients who are hospitalized, and of course, when we look at only patients who have severe disease, we're seeing something like 25% women, 75% men, uh, very clear cut towards more men having severe disease, we don't have a good explanation for that. So we don't really know why are men contracting a, a, a more severe disease or you know, developing a more severe disease. Uh, we know in medicine there are differences. It could be related to hormones. It could be related to other factors. We know that, for example, some autoimmune disease are much more common in, in females than in males. So these type of differences probably play a role here as well. With time, as we understand more the disease and the virus, I think we'll have a better answer to this question. Okay. And, of course, uh, people in L.A. are, are monitoring uh, the news here in Israel with great interest, and they've been reading about uh, the politics and the strain on our system with nurses and doctors between the Ministry of Health. Can you uh, tell our people who are... Uh, mamash, what you would call dedicated uh, uh, to our cause as to where we stand in dealing with this problem going forward and maybe how they can help us along the way? That's, that's a great question and, and, a, and a you know, real problem that we have here in Israel. Um, you know, in Israel, our main problem um, are not resources currently in terms of uh, the government stepping in. Our main problems are with staffing. Um, this is where we're in a problem. Um, to open a new corona unit, 
or a new corona ICU, we don't have more people we can bring in from the streets. You have to train people, you have to train nurses, you have to train doctors, of course, ICU nurses and ICU doctors even more than that. So it's not possible for us to just bring in new staff. So what we need to do is uh, allocate our staff from the, uh, um, from the normal wards, from the normal departments uh, to the corona departments uh, so that we're able to open up these new um, units to treat patients coming in and grow our capacity to treat the COVID-19 patients. This is something that is a problem. Uh, our way to try and deal with this problem, of course, again, uh, it stands, so, so it, it's a fact that we cannot bring in more staff. The main way for us and method that we've utilized is try to bring in new technology, like the technology you have seen, uh, developing new solutions that will allow us with the current staff to provide better treatments. This is um, the Israeli innovation. This is the Shiba innovation. This is what ARC is all about, uh, coming up with solutions that will allow us to treat patients better, not just by adding another nurse or another doctor, but by providing the existing nurses and doctors with better solutions that will allow them to treat better the growing number of patients that we're seeing. Uh, artificial intelligence, communication tools, monitoring tools, all of that that you've seen here, this is our way to push this forward and we're leading the world in terms of this type of development. Uh, and you know, this is where we think we need to put the effort. This is where we all need to mobilize to be able to provide more and more solutions and provide those solutions, not just to Sheba, but to take them out to the entire world. Yeah, just to underscore what Ayala is saying, that the interest in Sheba's ability uh, to deal with this pandemic through technology. The other day we did a webinar with China, right, Ayala? And how many people were on that webinar? 10 thousand people were on that webinar. So you can understand where the interest is in, in Sheba and Sheba being what we would call the National Hospital of Israel. Look to us to find those solutions rather than having manpower using technology to replace that manpower in order to accomplish what we need to do. The, the next uh, question that was in post us, and I think it's a very relevant question, is that one of the advantages of, of Sheba being in a top uh, 10 hospital for two years in a row is that a lot of hospitals in the United States have recognized Sheba's growing uh, global impact. How is Sheba sharing its info with other hospitals in the United States and vice versa? Because we know that we're getting calls almost every single day. Can you give some examples of that? Sure. So, um, you know, on day to day before COVID, um, we're working very closely with many leading hospitals in the world. We have our own uh, hospital community we work very closely with. Uh, they're part of uh, ARC, our ecosystem. And these are leading hospitals, mostly from North America. You're familiar with many of the names in your neighborhood. It's even uh, Cedar sinai that we work very closely with. Uh, but many other hospitals around, uh, around the US, Canada, and Europe. And we're sharing much of what we're learning with this growing community. And it's not just that the ARC community, but it, as Steve was giving an example from China, uh, another example, Steve, uh, you know, this was about three months ago, we almost forgot, but we had, uh, we were on a webinar hosted by the American Hospital Association and the Federation of American Hospitals with about 500 hospitals on the line, listening to what Shiba had to say on innovation, on telemedicine and other fronts. So more than 500 hospitals in the US uh, tuned in to listen to the innovation coming out of Shiba. So we're making a huge effort. Steve was mentioning that I do a webinar or two every day, which is, uh, which is true. Uh, we're doing a true effort to share what we're learning and to work with others to uh, come up with new solutions. And I'll share another secret. We don't typically say this. We even worked uh, a couple of times with uh, the New York Department of Health uh, when New York was the major crisis. Um, we all remember this about a month, a month and a half ago. They reached out to us because they had a couple of problems they had no solutions to. So the New York Department of Health reached out to Sheba and we gathered uh, a few partners on our side here in Israel to come up with solutions uh, and send them over to New York uh, during their, their times of need. So it's a very tight collaboration uh, and I think people are looking for, uh, to Sheba for guidance uh, during these times of crisis. Molly, I'll turn the, the microphone over to you uh, for a question or two from your end. 
Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Dr. Zimlichman and Yoel and all of our friends at Sheba for making today possible. Um, I also want to give a very quick shout out to those of you who missed the very first uh, minute of today. It wouldn't be possible without Mickey Fine Pharmacy, today's presenting sponsor. So we appreciate you. We have a question here in the chat about any additional preventative measures that people should be taking for COVID. I, I'm guessing, and I'm going to answer you. You mean on uh, on each of us on a personal level in terms of protective measures? Um, you know, this really has not really changed across time. I I was uh, in the U.S. Uh, you remember Steve? Uh, uh, very late in February when this thing was just coming around the horizon, it was still far away. We heard news from China during the time, and uh, I was on uh, national TV. And I was asked that question and I gave the same, pretty much the same answer I'm giving today. It's about wearing a mask, it's about hand hygiene, and it's about uh, uh, social distancing. These are the three things that we still need to comply with. And I will mention that what we've learned with time is that mask is critical. If we all comply with putting on a mask the proper way, covering the mouth and the nose, and if everybody complies with that, it's amazing, but we can almost return to normal activities if we were all to comply with that. We know now that the regular mask, what we call the surgical mask, is very effective in preventing uh, um, the disease from spreading and protecting each of us. Doesn't mean that the other two factors that I mentioned are less important, but I think the recent months have really re-emphasized the importance of having a mask. And again, if we wear a mask, we're almost able to, come, to go back to routines. The problem is that sometimes, um, you know, we, we take it off, sometimes we put our nose out, sometimes we drink, obviously, and eat in a public location. And so I don't think that a mask was invented that you can eat through. Maybe that's an invention for, for <laughs> ARC to think about. But that is one of the problems we have. Uh, zippers. A zipper. There is one. There is Maybe one. Maybe a zipper on the mask. But this is the main, uh, the main um, solution. Uh, so I urge everyone to uh, keep their masks on, especially in closed spaces. This is the one thing that we all need to uh, uh, comply with. Uh, Ina Tuller has, uh, has a very good question because we deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, the long-term uh, side effects for patients and COVID-19. I think I'll explain how Sheba is actually doing that with a unique clinic that we have because there are, unfortunately, a lot of side effects. Right. This is another thing we're learning because remember, uh, just a few months ago, we didn't have the long effect pr perspective. We couldn't really understand what are the long effect complications. So we're starting to understand now, if, especially if you contract a life-threatening disease, if you're hospitalized and, and uh, specifically if you're in the ICU, many of these patients uh, develop very prolonged uh, side effects, which could really affect almost any organ in the body from... Uh, the skin, to the kidneys, to the, of course, the lungs, uh, to the brain, to the heart, almost every um, uh, system can be, um, can be affected. And we're seeing a very wide and diverse um, complication uh, range from COVID. I'll also mention that uh, even if you have a mild to moderate disease, we're learning from a lot of patients who said, listen, we were very active before, we were running marathons before, and now, um, you know, I just had a very, a, a relatively mild disease, but I, I can't seem to go back to what I was doing before, um, to the amount of effort I was doing before. And it takes a long while to get back to your normal self after this disease. So uh, on one end, most people just have a very mild form of disease, uh, many ways flu-like, as we like to call it, uh, with no complications. But if you do have a moderate, and obviously if you do have a severe disease, um, there is a possibility of long-term effects, which we think now could go on for some patients for years, uh, whether it's uh, the need for rehabilitation later on. And here we're doing a lot of work on that at Chiba with our rehabilitation hospital. And many of our patients who were a long time in the ICU have moved on to the rehabilitation hospital. And the rehabilitation hospital, which we thought at the beginning of this was not going to play a critical role is now playing a very critical role mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, providing uh, uh, our patients with the solutions needed. Okay. And of course, 
there's been a lot of speculation in the media about once you have uh, the coronavirus, is it possible for you? Have we seen any cases here where you could possibly get it again? Or what are the chances of building up enough of uh, antibodies in your body to create some sort of immune response to another round uh, of the COVID virus? Another question, which I might call the, uh, you know, the, the big bonanza, because th this is a question that is very critical, obviously, as you could all understand. I'll say one thing. Uh, we do understand that probably immunity is not for life. Um, we're seeing some cases where the uh, antibody count is dropping with time, and we're starting to see cases where the antibodies are uh, basically almost gone um, a couple of months later. This is very individual between patients. Uh, what we have not seen is a confirmed, and I'll say this very uh, clearly, we have not seen confirmed cases of patients who contracted the disease twice. Although there have been reports about this in the news, these were likely cases where there was a mistake with the, uh, uh, with the test. As you know, the tests many times uh, when it's negative, uh, it has a, very, a pretty high uh, false negative rate, which means that you might test negative uh, on the test on the PCR when you're actually positive. That's why when you're negative, we many times uh, ask you to retake the test to see two negative tests to be sure that uh, you're actually negative. So maybe somebody has the disease, was tested negative, thought he was over the disease, and then was tested again and found positive. We think it's probably because of a mistake uh, on the PCR testing. Uh, so we've not seen these type of cases. But the reason this question, Steve, is so critical is because this will shed a lot of light later on on the effectiveness of the vaccine. What we're likely to be seeing, and of course we don't know for sure, is that vaccination, when they do come around, will provi provide us with immunity for a certain amount of time. Whether it's six months, whether it's one year, whether it's five years, we don't know, and of course it will depend on the vaccination. Uh, we're, there are many companies working on a vaccine, as you know, and uh, different types of vaccines will have different span of immunization. Um, but likely we will need to repeat vaccination after a while, like we're doing with influenza, like we're doing with other types of uh, uh, infectious disease, viral disease we're seeing. Uh, so one vaccine will not uh, provide you with immunity for life. We will need to retest and revaccinate patients once we do have a vaccine out. Thank you, Ayal. I'd like to uh, turn the microphone over to Yoel as uh, we wrap things up here, five minutes uh, out. Yoel? Yeah, hello, everyone uh, in LA and over the uh, US continent. Uh, I want to thank Eyal Zimilchman for uh, sharing his knowledge and his uh, experience in the last, uh, I would say, three and a half months here. Thank you, Steve, for uh, elaborating this uh, mission. I want to thank the uh, professional staff in LA, Rachel and Molly, and of course, Ina and Vicky for co-chairing this wonderful uh, opportunity. Personally, you know that I will prefer to put on my talks and be with you at the Four Seasons, but due to the situation, uh, I need to sit here with the Yal and, and Steve <laughs> and just dream and hope to see you next year with good health. So wishing you a beautiful day and stay safe. Shalom and goodbye. Thank you.